Uh, my name is Matt Ort, and I want to welcome you to our to our webinar today. And with me is uh, our our guest Julie Selesnik with Berger Montague. And so Julie is a subject matter expert on a variety of topics, but the topic today is especially focused around CAA and employer fiduciary responsibility. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And uh, this is, uh, I think, a, grow a growing topic of popularity and one that's going to be, I think, especially relevant starting in this year. And so some brief introduction. So if you're not familiar with my background, it's kind of unique in that I spent about 25 years. I'm revealing my age now a little bit, but uh, almost 25 years in human resources leadership. And the first two thirds of my career, I really was kind of status quo on healthcare and the health plan and really didn't know what I didn't know. And I uh, went through the motions of the enrollment meetings and so forth, and which is still happening a lot today. And then uh, really just some things sparked my interest, a request even from owners as I took a role at the v, as the VP of HR at Merrill Steel in central Wisconsin. And we began digging into healthcare and I been, uh, began learning a lot. And so we took off and I led a transformational journey of our health plan uh, which turned into just uh, recently, a couple of years ago, co-founding a company called Self Fund Health uh, to help other employers uh, implement a high-performing self plan, one like the one we did at Merrill Steel that saved millions of dollars and made the healthcare uh, far better. So there's a lot of pieces and components and a lot of complexity, as you well know. And then that was followed by even publishing a book. Really, there's a gap of education out there and just really uh, a big kind of drive, if you will, about education. I'll be traveling around quite a bit this year and speaking at different events across the nation. So that's a little bit about me. So um, so our guest today is Julie uh, Selesnik, and I'll turn it over to you, Julie, so for some introduction about yourself as well. Hi, everybody. I am Julie Selesnik. I'm Senior Counsel at Berger Monte um, and the Health Benefits Law Group. I am an ERISA attorney, plaintiff side, and I have spent a long time working in the ERISA space on behalf of plaintiffs filing class actions previously in the 401k space, but for several years have been focused on healthcare and have sort of pivoted in that half of our group now focuses on advising employers and other vendors trying to help employers on how to meet their fiduciary obligations under health plans, and particularly since passage of the CAA and transparency and coverage and, and other attendant rules. And the other half is spent litigating mainly these days against um, large insurance companies who either refuse to give up claims data or act as fiduciaries um, and engage in practices that put employer fiduciaries at risk. And also just, you know, good old fashioned sort of um, breach of fiduciary duty and denial of benefit claims. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. Appreciate you joining. And, uh, you know, my my goal for today, and this we'll do these, we'll try to do these about once a month, but my goal in these is to uh, primarily education. So we're all learning, right? Every day, mm -hmm. continuous lifelong learning. And, uh, and maybe even to have a little fun in the process. Um, so, right, to have a, some humor or, or just keep it a little bit lighthearted as these are some pretty uh, detailed topics. So we'll try to do our best with that as well. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll start off, Julie. Uh, so the CAA, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 21, uh, is, seems to be um, pretty relevant and a lot of what's happening today, or at least will be happening soon. Could you kind of you know, just, just for, there's a lot of experts on the call as well, but, you know, kind of cover that briefly as far as just what that is and maybe just some of the key parts of that. ERISA is the law that has always governed employer-sponsored health plans, except for a small category of health plans, sort of um, non-federal governmental health plans, church plans. Other than that, they're ERISA governed. ERISA is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And employers have always already been fiduciaries of their health plans, same as labor trustees. So being a fiduciary to your health plan is not new and it didn't come with the CAA. The problem has been that it's been very difficult to be a good fiduciary to a health plan prior to the passage of the CAA because there has been an inability for employers and other plan fiduciaries to access the information necessary to make fiduciary decisions. The Consolidated Appropriations Act is just the spending bill that Congress passes every year. So there's the CAA of 2020, 2021, 2022. You'll keep seeing it 
The one of 2021 happened to contain several provisions related to healthcare transparency, which is why it's important to us and why it's become such a huge focus in the world of ERISA governed health, employer sponsored health plans. So the CAA of 2021 <clears throat> brought a lot of new transparency laws. It brings the No Surprises Act, but for purposes of today's call, it brings four sort of major changes that employers have to be aware of and that are supposed to help employers be better fiduciaries, but they also come with new sort of obligations and, and risk of enforcement or litigation if employers don't do what they're supposed to do and use these new rules to their benefit. Mm -hmm. So really briefly, you've got Section 201 of the, you know, Division 2, Section BB of the CAA. That's the um, gag clause removal. And what it says is, you can't have gag clauses in the contracts between health plans and either providers or whoever's providing access to the network of providers. So this is usually administrative service agreements and PBM agreements or any direct contracts. And a gag clause is anything that prevents you from accessing cost and quality information. So claims data, it's really anything that keeps you from getting the claims data. But what everyone's, and this has been sort of the focus of everyone for the past year, not even just the gag clause removal, but the attestation. And so probably everyone on the phone is familiar with the attestation requirement, which just passed for 2023. It was December 31st, where plans were supposed to attest that they've removed all the gag clauses to, you know, CMS and, and filed this on the website. Then you've got section 202, which is the compensation disclosure requirements. So for a second, let me back up. All of these um, provisions we're talking about apply to health plans across the board, whether or not they're governed by ERISA, except for this one. This compensation disclosure requirement is an ERISA only um, rule. And so if you're an ERISA governed plan, all of the vendors that are that will earn a thousand dollars or more in direct or indirect um, <clears throat> compensation working on your health plan, in any calendar year are supposed to make compensation disclosures to the plan. And these are supposed to be provided sort of in advance of extending or entering a new contract or extending an existing one so that plans can assess, is the compensation I'm paying reasonable? Um, that's 202. 203 is uh, prescription, drug, and data collection and reporting. And that's the one that sort of, this is sort of the only one that has been um, taken over effectively by the TPAs and PBMs, and they've been doing most of this reporting on behalf of the plans, albeit without always sharing the data that they're submitting on your behalf with the plan, which is a problem. Um, but that is so that CMS is presumably going to take all of this information and it's things like your top 50 drug spend, what prices went up the most, things like that, so that we can look for trends and how to sort of change the, the bad trends. Then the fourth is the mental health parity comparative analysis requirement for non-quantitative treatment limitations. So obviously, you know, if there's a difference quantitatively, like there's a out-of-pocket difference between mental health substance use disorder part of the plan versus uh, medical benefit. But this is about non-quantitative. So things like um, do you have failed first um, policies in your, maybe in your dispensary for um, substance use disorder that you don't have on the medical side? Do you have a robust network on the mental health side as robust as on the medical side? Things like that. You have to show parity. And these reports are required now to be in every employer's file. So those are the four big changes that come with the CAA of 2020. Yeah, great summary. And, you know, I think just the notion, as you were saying that, the notion of you can't manage what you don't see Right. So, I mean, this this claims data visibility and transparency is key. And that's really the spark for change. It doesn't solve the problem, but it opens the door to the problem. And that uh, at least what I've seen and even experienced it directly myself, we see this interesting dynamic of employers kind of uh, not taking ownership of their health plan, kind of delegating it to the seller side, of course, which is having their way very nicely. Uh, with these plans and we see these laws kicking in and where it's really saying employer you are responsible can you can you talk about i've heard things like uh you know cfos could be actually personally prosecuted and some things like that and maybe and just could you maybe just touch on who's kind of responsible here and who's going to end up in the defendant chair if you will if this goes further so here's the problem 
is that you can delegate responsibility to vendors and service providers, but what you can never ever delegate is your responsibility to oversee those vendors and to supervise them and monitor them and make sure that they are following the rules that are required of fiduciaries, which are, so if you're delegating fiduciary authority, you're also still required to supervise those people you've delegated authority to and make sure that they're only spending dollars for plan benefits and that it, they're only on reasonable costs, that there's no prohibited transactions, no self-dealing, things like that. And that is sort of the problem that we're in is that there's an, uh, has been a, just a rank inability to supervise sort of service providers. I mean, try and supervise, you know, what Blue Cross Blue Shield is doing when they're adjudicating claims and see how well that goes. It's very difficult. It's, it's an opaque system. It's hard to penetrate. It's hard to understand how claims are paid. It's hard to fix it when you find a mistake and things like that. But at the end of the day, whether or not you can hold somebody else liable, for their breaches does not absolve you, the plan fiduciary, particularly the plan administrator sponsor of your own fiduciary liability, you're still liable. And so not only can the plan be sued for fiduciary breach, but individual fiduciaries can be sued in their individual capacity for fiduciary breach by uh, employees, former employees, spouses, participants, beneficiaries. So one really important thing is to make sure you have, you know, really good fiduciary liability insurance in place, because these lawsuits will become more prevalent as, you know, this area of litigation takes hold. And there are going to be a lot more lawsuits. And, you know, they might not be huge sweeping lawsuits at first, like you're seeing against insurance carriers. But one lawsuit, you know, first of all, you don't want this as a company, a lawsuit that says you're, you know, being a poor fiduciary and mismanaging your healthcare fund, bad for your reputation, it's bad for recruiting, bad for employee recruiting and retention, but also it opens the door to more scrutiny, to more enforcement, and to more lawsuits, and to looking at how you're managing your plan. So the more you get in front of this, the better it is to sort of limit what's coming down the road. Yeah, it seems to me that there's kind of stages here, right? So I, I'm kind of an employer advocate, employee advocate. That's that's my view of the world a little bit. Um, and um, if you, especially the larger employers, say the ones that are in various states or or uh, have many locations, um, in at least generically, it seems that if they their only choice really, unless they want to build like part by part by piece by piece in each region. Uh, which is happening a little bit, uh, but they have to sign up for these big buka plans, and so the so their their hands are kind of tied in respect to these networks, these very uh, inclusive networks, if you will, that um, that that only allow them access to the to the providers. Right, it's the only way to do it. So there's these stages of well, first, okay, you've got to see your claims data, you've got to see if you're managing those costs. But the employer seems like they kind of lift up their hands at least at first and say, wait a minute. Um, you're holding me responsible. If I'm the CFO of a company, you're ready to put me in an orange suit here. Um, but but if you look at the CAA and then the steps, then it's okay, well, I need access to the gag clause. Okay, so I need access to my claims data. There's a good initial step. And so uh, I think there is, you know, the, the fiduciary responsibility is happening in stages. So one of the thing, one of the interesting things about your law firm and your actions is, um, Right where where employers seem to be the fiduciary responsibility and ultimately responsible. However, we're seeing maybe trends where employers are suing the carrier and things like that. Could you talk about maybe some of the the prominent cases that you have going or you've started and how they're relevant to what we're talking about here? Yeah, and just to be clear, we're not the only firm that has brought cases like this. There have been a couple other ones. Mm. Ours, as far as I know, though, are the only ones that are continuing to go forward. The others that either settled or gone to arbitration at this point. But there was a case brought by Owen, uh, Owen and Miners versus Anthem. And that case, I believe, has now gone to arbitration. It was over access to claims data. Um, Kraft Heinz versus Aetna has now gone to arbitration as well, is my understanding from the last public filing. Also over access to claims data and all kinds of sort of accusatory um you know, really interesting allegations made there based on the claims data they were able to access. And that case was just recently dismissed and sent to arbitration based on public filings. And there was one other case up in Massachusetts against United by a bankruptcy trustee. And it was um, 
So it was on behalf of a, a bankrupt um, transportation company. I can't remember the name right now, New England Motors, maybe um, against United. Also for, you know, you didn't give us access to our claims data and they, were, they blamed them as part of the reason they went bankrupt. And after this wow. scathing summary judgment motion that was filed by the bankruptcy trustee, that settled immediately. So um, that's a very interesting one. If anyone ever wants to read it, just shoot me an email and I'll pass it around. But we have two cases pending that I find particularly interesting in this area. One is in Connecticut on behalf of two labor unions, um, the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, Local 40 in Connecticut, and Sheet Metal Workers, in uh, Sheet Metal Workers Local 1, both in Connecticut and both against Anthem um, for one, the inability to access claims data. And, you know, you can read in the filings the sort of trials and tribulations that both funds went through trying to access their claims data until finally they just hit a brick wall and both decided that they had no further recourse but had to file litigation. And also what they did find with the limited claims data they had, you know, was sort of not what they expected to find. And there are allegations in the complaint about how they weren't priced the way they expected them to be priced. And it's pretty interesting. There's been a motion to dismiss has been briefed and not decided in that case and discovery is ongoing. Um, it's interesting to read Anthem's position in that because you can sort of see what the insurance carrier's positions will be on this. And one interesting position that Anthem takes in that case and also in the case of Owens v. Miners that all employers should be aware of is, hey, it's not our responsibility to give you your data under the CAA. We don't have to get rid of gag clauses or do anything you do. And if you don't like the contract that you negotiated, you should negotiate a better one. That's basically the Owens v. Miners response, um, you know, verbatim and a similar response in the Connecticut case. And so really it is a self-help environment. And it is right now for employers do have to understand it is like swimming upstream. You are really going against the grain, trying to do something that there is a vested interest on the other side that you not do. And so it's extremely difficult. Another case we have pending is in state court in Massachusetts. And probably some people on this call are familiar with um, the federal litigation that was brought by the Massachusetts laborers against Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. And that went up through the first circuit and ended up, <laughs> um, it, it didn't have a favorable outcome because that circuit has a narrow viewpoint of who is a fiduciary for a plan. And they found that in that case, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts was not a fiduciary, so it wasn't a proper ERISA case. So after that happened, my firm joined um, the existing counsel on the case, Zuckerman Spader, and we now jointly represent the client, Massachusetts laborers, in a state court action. And we're suing for breach of contract, which is what the you know Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts argued the entire through the entirety of the federal case that this was a contract issue. It should be handled as a matter of contract law. So we gave them their wish and filed a breach of contract suit in state court. But there are also claims based on sort of Massachusetts statutes about unfair business practices and things like that, which provide for really different types of remedies than ERISA does. And, are you know, is another option if employers want to sort of go on the offense instead of waiting to get sued, you know, because they're unable to do something, taking the reins and taking charge and being sort of the, the lightning rod that brings the change. And so we are entering an environment where it's sort of do something or have something done to you. And so if you can do something without litigation, obviously most people would vastly prefer that. But sometimes it gets to the point where you realize you're not going to be able to do anything. And when that happens, it might be worth looking into either litigating against your administrative service provider using the dispute resolution mechanisms that are inside your administrative service agreements. They all have sort of mediation and arbitration provisions implementing them saying, look, we have a fundamental disagreement here on you're saying you're not a fiduciary, but then you're saying we are the fiduciary, but then you won't give us access to the data we need to make fiduciary decisions. Help us mediator. How do we resolve this? Because at some point, these issues have to be worked out. And if employers don't work it out, they're going to be worked out for them in a way that doesn't result favorably. Yeah, this you know, seems to be fascinating of how this might play out, right? We know the employer is the ultimate fiduciary owner, uh, but there's a lot of things that need to happen first before that can happen. So you see these middle 
these middle level kind of cases where employers or unions are suing and for access to data to do what they want to do and what they're required by law to do. Uh, I'm not sure who coined it or created it. I used it once in an article, but there's there's this really fascinating concept that employees, now this seems weird to me having worked for an employer, but right, a, a class action type suit or employees can get together and sue their own employer. Now that seems weird in the respect that you're still working for that employer and it creates a lot of awkwardness. And um, but this, But the example that was given was right? You're, you're buying my health care can afford me. I have little power. I go into these and as an employee, I go into these enrollment meetings and you tell me every year my deductible is going up and my premiums going up and there's very little power. And, and even if I'm savvy or even if I know a little bit about health care, there's very little I can do within my health plan design that seems to be crumbling before my eyes. Um, the grocery example is interesting to say, what if you hired your employer, employer to uh, or at least your employer was buying your groceries for you. So we say, okay, yeah, uh, everything's gone up, but at least in our area, you know, a gallon of milk in, the, in America's dairy land is somewhere around $4 an hour, an hour, $4 a gallon. And uh, eggs are, well, I don't know what they are, four or $5 a dozen and so forth. And, and meat is so much per pound. And we, so we know what that should cost based on a free market. And so uh, the example was given was, okay, and then as an employee, you find out that the employer has been paying $100 for a gallon of milk and a $150 for a dozen of eggs and so forth. And it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, you're not really managing this well for me, yet my hands are tied. I still go in and I have to pay these premiums to keep my family out of bankruptcy for health care. So uh, it's really interesting dynamic about ultimately the employers are, I think it's going to all funnel down, it seems to me. Uh, that they're they're responsible. Any thoughts on that? So they are. And I think, you know, I haven't been able to keep up with the Q&A yet, but I did see a question yeah. about, you know, are there going to be lawsuits? Is Jerry Schlichter going to file some lawsuits? And um, I, I appreciate this question. And this is sort of in the background. I think a lot of people know that there have been some plaintiffs firms, mainly Schlichter, Bogart, and Denton, that have been looking already for plaintiffs who work for certain companies, large companies, to, to come forward so that they can sue their companies. The real issue here has been, you know, so there's sort of this one school of thought that people think this is going to be just like the 401k litigation space was in ERISA. And I don't, for people who have, might have followed it, I don't know, but 401ks, the first pensions, then it moved into 401ks, have been sort of, this has been an area where ERISA litigation has been very effective in lowering fees and sort of cleaning up a lot of just excess fees that were being charged to participants in these plans. And um, <coughs> the major, you know, changes have d been done and now we're sort of, you know, at the lower rungs and, and the final cleanup stages have happened and people are wondering, will this be exactly how it works in the healthcare space? And to be honest, four years ago, um, Karen Handorf, who is, you know, who I work with, and we ca came together from our prior firm to Burger Montague to focus on healthcare ERISA. We thought the same. We thought this was what was going to happen. And we were now going to file class action lawsuits against employers, same as we did in 401k space um, about, you know, healthcare excessive costs and fees. Well, as we started to work on it, we realized that wasn't going to be the case. And part of the reason why was what we've already been discussing. Employers just, you know, in your 401k, you're, as the employer, you could always know what the fees were going to be. You could always see what they were going to cost. You could benchmark. There was always benchmarking mm -hmm. available. It's completely dissimilar in healthcare because you just, it's a black hole and you don't know, even if you know, say, even if you do find out the cost of your own plan, it's very hard to know what to compare them to until recently. We're starting to get these tools and these public sort of, you know, you know, you see all these apps coming out and and you see it all over LinkedIn. There's Billy. There's other things where you can see prices online in real time at area hospitals and you can compare. You've got hospital price transparency where they're listing the prices. You got machine readable files, which if it doesn't crash your computer, you can see what things are supposed to cost. Now this year, you're going to be able to, you know, patients are going to be able to get estimates and know what things will cost in advance, things like that. So that's changing. But it's still not, we're not there yet. And so you still, A, don't always know what things cost. And B, once you do, don't know what they cost in comparison to the people around you. And three, knowing what something costs that a ho at a hospital 
doesn't isn't the same as knowing what the price your employer is going to have to pay for it based on the deal that their administrative service provider has with that hospital in their contract, which no one has access to, which might have some provision that affects the final price. So there's still some steps to connect and they make it difficult to bring the same types of lawsuits. Another sort of issue mm -hmm. that has kept that from happening is in the 401k space, you've got retirees. They don't mind suing their former employers, mm -hmm. you know, because they don't work there anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a lot different to sue the place you're currently employed by and say, you're not giving me proper health care while retaliation is not allowed under ERISA. I mean, it, realistically, it's not going to go well for the employee that is the class representative of the litigation against their employer. I just can look at, you know, any other big case like this. And it's just, that's how it is. So I think that there's been sort of a number of things that have worked to sort of not have this pan out yet as a lot of lawsuits against employers. However, there are already lawsuits against employers, particularly when it comes to mental health parity. And that is where employers right. should be most nervous because if you have an employer or participant that calls your HR department tomorrow and says, hey, we want a copy of your comparative analysis report about your NQTLs, you have to give it to them. It's a planned document. And if you don't give it to them within 30 days, you're already subject to daily penalties yeah. per member per day, $110. In addition to now you're looking at, they if they report you to the DOL, you've just opened a big can of worms. This is where all the DOL enforcement money is focused. It's on mental health parity enforcement. So that is almost a guaranteed enforcement action. And you've opened the door to litigation. If you don't have it, whoever asked for it, asked for it because they probably suspect there is already a problem there. And that's going to be the first thing used against you in the litigation is you didn't even do an analysis. So that's an area where employers are already being sued by their employees, particularly on behalf of their children, who when they're unable to find sort of you know, proper care for them for residential treatment or things like that. That's an area that's already sort of taken off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if, I think if I were an attorney, which I'm not, but I'd be licking my chops in this environment. I mean, I look at, you know, I had asked you before, what's the maybe the biggest way that an employer would get sued right now in today's environment? You had said the mental the health parity, which then was passed in something like 96. And this is just a strengthening and a shining the light on this. And I, I would imagine myself as an HR professional, um, you know, I, but I think most, you know, so most HR professionals, if somebody were to come in and to ask that question, I think it would be like, I'm going to need to look into that. I basically have no idea what you're talking about. Maybe, I mean, if they're well-researched, uh, but to do have done this analysis, I mean, what's your impression? And you could break it down by the comp disclosure or the gag clause, et cetera. But what's your impression of compliance just even if it's gut feel by employers of of these laws it's really low <laughs> i would say that you know the probably the best compliance so far is with filing an attestation which is you know that's great good job and i get why employers have been focused on that because that's sort of an affirmative thing they have to do and check off their list because mm -hmm. it's being submitted to a government agency and I would say a lot of the angst has been focused on that. Um, but even that, if it approached anywhere near 50%, <laughs> I'd be shocked, right. like shocked. And I'd say more like 20% if I really right. had to guess. Um, as far as actually removing gag clauses, <laughs> um, I would say it's much lower than the attestation yeah. would suggest. And then as far as getting claims data, which is the ultimate purpose of removing the gag clauses, um, I would say we're way under 10% of plans that have actually tried to get their data and then use it to make decisions. And that's the whole purpose of all of this is to get the data so that you could be a better fiduciary. When it comes to compensation disclosures, I think that compliance is pitiful. And I think that there's a lot of blame to spread here. First of all, you know, brokers and consultants should be automatically giving these things to plans and any ones that aren't are recalcitrant. They should know that they're supposed to do this. Um, they're named in the law. It says brokers and consultants, which was an unfortunate word choice because really it's supposed to apply to all of the plan service providers. Mm -hmm. And Congress made that clear in a letter to the DOL a year ago, December, which I 
shared on LinkedIn to all the naysayers who said the TPAs didn't have to do it, PBMs didn't have to do it. Congress made clear that it's supposed to apply to all of them and that the, the agencies needed to you know, give further guidance so people would know this. But so far, there hasn't been really good guidance to strengthen this. And I don't see plans. Also, the law is a kind of, you know, so I can also blame the law on this. Here's what you're supposed to do if you don't get your compensation disclosure. You're supposed to request it formally in writing. And if you don't get it within like 45 days, you have to notify the DOL. You have to end the contract. It's a prohibited transaction automatically. And, and you're supposed to immediately get yourself a new service provider. This is not realistic. And this is not how health plans work. And so, you know, I get why compliance feels like a horrible hurdle to a lot of employers is because in some ways it's not possible to comply with these laws as written. However, doing something is always better than doing nothing. And I really think that doing something is what plans need to be doing and what mm -hmm. plan advisors need to be encouraging their plan clients to be doing. Um, when it comes to data with the prescription drug uh, reporting, I bet that's the highest compliance rate because mm -hmm. it's a requirement also on the insurers and PBMs, and they've sort of handled this function on behalf of plans. However, what's interesting is one of the categories of data collected is rebates. And one thing I have found almost uniformly with clients is that they're not getting a copy of what is being submitted on their behalf by their TPAs and PBMs to CMS about their prescription drug reporting. And so they still don't know their rebate numbers and, and their top spends and things like that. That's insane. And the idea that these guys are submitting your info and not sharing it with you and refuse to share it with you is just, it's ludicrous. But that is in fact the majority case that I've seen. And then for the mental health parity, this is really hard because it's, almost impossible for a plan to do a compliant um, NQTL comparative analysis at this stage of the game, because you need all of this underlying claims data. You need all this comparison data. You need all kinds of data that you still can't get from the carrier that is acting as your administrative service provider. You also, you didn't, as a self-funded employer, no matter what the fiction out there is, you didn't create this network. You didn't create this plan. You're you didn't you're not the one who has the ability to make sure there are no NQTLs to begin with. So, for example, you know one of, one of the big issues is um, network adequacy. Well, network adequacy is a big problem in the mental health and substance use disorder side, particularly if you've ever tried to find you know a child psychologist for a kid in a, in most areas, it's almost impossible. You, maybe there's two that don't have like, you know, D minus grades on health grades or something. Whereas on the primary care side, there's a zillion. So there's obviously not any sort of comparative, you know, parity there, but adequate, there's not even adequacy in many cases. And you have to add in sort of point solutions that are offered out there. So plans, if plans want to have a compliant plan, they can't even rely on the network they're purchasing. They have to buy a supplement, you know, to make it make it be in parent. So it's really, it seems to me that where the DOL should be focusing as enforcement and mental health parity is on the creators of these networks and plans, but they don't. It, it, the focus is definitely mm -hmm. on the employer. So employers have to at least push back and, and try and do these analyses to the extent possible, request the information they need to finish it. And when they do come across something that seems like um, <laughs> a violation, they have to follow up on it and say, hey, you know, why isn't um, ABA therapy covered for autism under our plan? We have, we have participants that are very upset by this. This is a big, that's, a, I mentioned that one because that's a big hot button um annually for the DOL and it's in every report that this should be covered and they find they flag it every time and the problem is if you do end up in a DOL enforcement action and they come and look and find that you're not in parity and there's violation they will send a letter to every participant in the plan so do you think you're more likely to get sued at that point once a government agency sends you a letter that tells you your plan is violating the law probably right so that is where I think plans really are in the most danger Great information. We um and by the way, operationally here, so it looks like the chat function is turned off, and I it looks like I cannot, to my knowledge, turn that on. So I will do that next month uh, within the meeting. So if, if there is an easy way, let me know. We also have about 
20 questions. So here shortly, we can maybe transition to those. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm able to see those. So forgive me for the chat. Uh, must be, I didn't click the right box in the setup, which there are a lot of boxes in these webinar setups. Uh, but we're certainly seeing this this dynamic in, in the industry where if you say the industry in general, uh, the hospital systems, the carriers, and then the large, at least the large or all brokerage firms, right? So they're, you know, and then you have the sellers and then you have the the buyers, which are the of the commercial plans, which are the employers. We have a dynamic where some are waiting for the, what appears to be the sellers to fix these problems. But I always kind of add in and say, these aren't really problems for the sellers. Actually, the status quo is working really well. So if you're an employer, you're working with an employer, you have to realize that, uh, they're maybe not all that motivated. There might be a lot of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and so forth, but but are where are the real fixes? I see a lot of action here, uh, a lot of, right? A lot of things going on, new laws kicking in um, and affecting, you know, especially affecting the buyers. I'm hearing the increases of the last couple of years are just becoming almost exponential uh, where employers are maybe starting to wake up or starting to get more concerned uh, but one of the things maybe so that maybe everyone doesn't realize, and I'll give a couple employer perspective points, is that uh, sometimes it's it's the fourth or the fifth, but I would say at least in manufacturing or a lot of industries, healthcare is the second or third largest expense of the employer overall, not, not people expense or HR expense, but business expense. And it's interesting that it's off the radar. And then I give a quick, you know, I give an example in the book, but a real life story where I was supporting the custodial team and our commercial vacuum broke. And I had to go through this purchasing process for, a, we, we bought the same one. Like it wasn't even that big of a decision. Like we just need a new one. We like this one. It lasted forever. But I was filling out these paperwork for this purchasing process for like two or three hours. And I'm thinking to myself, I had just signed that morning with, with a nod, just a nod from the CFO, no paperwork, no purchasing, no three quotes for stop loss for something like $700,000. <laughs> and so here we have a case within companies where healthcare has been delegated to the seller so much, and there's such a lack of understanding from the CFO or HR or CEO. Most CEOs even maybe don't even understand what self-funding is and if they're self-funded and things like that. And so it needs to be on the radar. It needs to be managed. You know, they're good at managing all these things, by the way, the skills are there. The skills are there to manage purchasing and revenue and, and, and financial things, but it's just off the radar. The second point I'd like to make is that I think maybe everyone doesn't realize is why are employers so hesitant? One is there's an education gap, which we'll try to fill in many ways through these meetings that we'll have monthly. Uh, but this is almost, if you might say, risking the business, right? So these smaller companies we're seeing, when I worked with John Trinas and, the, and he gave me some feedback, he read the whole book cover to cover. And he's like, I want to I want to give you some feedback on the title, you should add save your company to the front of it. I'm like, okay, and so I did. And that was john's idea. But he said, I'm not sure we'd be around if we hadn't done what we've done in healthcare. And we're seeing these companies now, especially the, the smaller ones 50 or 100. And there's, it's starting if they if they lose their health plan if they can whether it's fully insured or self insured if they can't afford their health plan they're risking their whole business that right they're going to lose their best folks because they're going to they're going to flock to the ones with health coverage and so I don't know if we if maybe everyone realizes the severity so we, and so any size company if a company is looking at changing their health plan this is very risky for them because their workforce which is already highly competitive would be at risk. They can't afford to have something go wrong and lose a bulk of their employees. So just to kind of bring that out and shine the light on that, that uh, uh, this is a big deal for employers and there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of restrictions and so forth. And so that might be one of the many reasons why we see a hesitance to act here is that there's a lot at risk. And, I couldn't uh, agree more. Yeah. And it's a nightmare situation because if you don't act, you're just a sitting duck waiting. Am I going to be sued? Is the DOL going to come knocking on my door? If you do act, what if, you know, everyone is convinced that if they don't have a nationally recognized logo on their healthcare card, that they'll never get a new employee. <laughs> everyone will jump ship if they don't recognize the name. And so you still feel like you have to stick with one of the major carriers and the major carriers all behave the same. And so it's very, it, it, no matter what you, it, this is why 
it's such a difficult lift is because everything you try and do is hard <laughs> and then nothing is happening effectively. And you hit the nail on the head earlier, waiting for the people who it's working for to fix it is never going to happen. There, there's zero you know, motivation on the side of the carrier to change things. This works great. You know, they're, they're the ones that are reporting the multi-billion dollar profits quarterly. And so why would they want to change this system and have you pushing back and asking these questions and seeing the data and wanting to see their contracts with the hospitals and all these horrible things that could undermine the gravy train? They don't. And so it is a very difficult environment to make change with them. Yeah, for sure. So we've got about just a little bit over 15 minutes left, and I'd like to transition to the Q&A. You, can you see the Q&A, Julie? Let me pull it Hopefully. Um, so uh, what I what I can do is I, I see one that was addressed to me and I could jump in and take that quick. And then so we're, so we're not staring at the questions while everyone watches us. If you could maybe browse and pick one out and go next, would that work? And uh, so there's one here that says, uh, Matt, from your perspective, what is going to take what is it going to take to get more employers to take action? I come from 20 plus years in strategic sourcing for good services why isn't purchasing and supply chain management involved? Why not the CFO? What is going to change outside of the lawsuits uh, uh, overall? So it's a great question, Chris. And uh, and I had just kind of touched on being off the radar. But yeah, I think when we see companies getting CFOs and CEO, CEOs involved, they're more likely to start looking at the financial and business side of things. HR folks on average aren't say business experts, if you will, or digging into financial reports. No, some are, and that's okay, and they should be. Uh, but they're they're probably, I think in most cases, my experience and my experience from the first two thirds of my career, right, have been in those shoes, is that we're working inside this box that the industry has given us. So, uh, right, it's this, how does this work? Oh, it's in network. Okay, I'm gonna maneuver within this, this system and so forth. And there's no visibility to prices, but I get 40% off. 40% off of this hospital. Uh, and what's their price? Well, I have no idea what unit price is, but 40% off is better than 30%. I know that much. Although actually it may not be because the other hospital may have lower prices. So 30% off could be better. So we, we're we dealing with these games, if you will, or this, this structure that the industry is giving us. And we've got to get out of that box. We have got to, we have got to think and we have got to use our, uh, our God-given brains here. And, uh, and use what we know and and do things that are logical and start scratching our head and say, that doesn't make sense. I still don't know what I'm paying. We see the industry has been shut down. Uh, the free market part of the industry uh, has been shut down and that if we take things for granted and everything else, when we go to purchase something, there are things uh, the, it's called BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, uh, the acronym, but it basically means we can walk away. That's our power when we're buying something, if we go to buy something and the price is too high or the quality is too low, we simply say, thank you, I'll keep it in mind, but I'm going to go somewhere else. So there's power in that. And with that is the visibility of cost and the visibility of quality. The industry has interestingly shut all that down. Uh, when we shop for healthcare, we have to shop here, whether it's a good deal or it's a bad deal, and we don't even know if it's a good deal or a bad deal. So the point about, I've heard many say this, this would be a great article, by the way, uh, turn over your healthcare, your health plan management to your purchasing or your logistics or whatever you call it within your company. Turn that over to that department and watch what happens. They would be scratching their heads because they're so used to the free market way. We get we fight for 1% off here or 2% off. In healthcare, it's like we could save 20%. We could get an MRI for 600 instead of 6,000. A joint replacement for 17 instead of 80,000. I've even heard 150,000 these prices. It's like we're making up numbers. So you bring up an excellent point. We just need to start looking at healthcare as we're purchasing healthcare services and like it's a business. And it, and it is, it's different because we we're caring for our health, but it's, we're still purchasing a service. So excellent point. Now, so Julie, did you find any there on the list that stood out? Oh uh, yeah. I'll just go through them while we have time, starting with Chris. I know a lot of you folks in the chat. Hi, Chris. Um, so I think I already spoke about um, sort of why there haven't been the sort of class actions filed by Schlichter or others. And I'm not sure that I think the difference is it being a defined benefit versus defined contribution. I think it's more um, 
the reasons that I discussed earlier, that it's just more difficult to find current employees willing to sue their employers. You could get a former employee. However, a former employee in a class action, you cannot get forward change. So you cannot get injunctive relief going forward and say in the future, they can no longer do this. So that's not a good plaintiff. You need someone that is currently a participant in the program. And that's what makes it difficult. There are potentially retiree health plans, retirees on health plans that could bring these suits, but it's just been a harder slog. And again, the DOL has tried to bring a couple of these that have been unsuccessful. And so that's another sort of put a chilling effect on why these cases haven't been filed. They sued, there's a case of cost of each chimes where they, the DOL um, sued this company called chimes in, in the district of Columbia. They said they weren't, um, you know, doing a proper monitoring of their service providers and they lost. And Chimes proved that they were doing as well as they could possibly do in the environment that they were acting within, and they won. And there's another case against Macy's, and again they lost. And so it's just a di- it's just a different environment because it is so opaque, anti-competitive, and hard to sort of exist in. That employers have, at least until very recently, been able to plead, "I'm doing my best, but you know this is all I can do." Now. In the future, will that change? Probably, but it's not going to be the same as it unfolded in the 401k space. I think there'll be more targeted types of litigation. So for instance, mm-hmm. one thing I could see a class action lawsuit being filed over in the near future is on the issue of cross plan offsetting. This has been an issue that has been litigated over and over against insurance carriers um, by firms like mine that say, hey, you cannot... Um, in an out of network claim, take money that you're that you've said is 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 payable as a covered benefit, and then offset it and put it in your own pocket because you made an overpayment in a different plan. That you, especially when you fully insure and you're going to take that money and divert it. And the Eighth Circuit has found that you can't do it. The front, Fourth Circuit has found you can't do it. The DOL just settled with an insurance company in a very public sort of enforcement action, and they've said they'll stop doing it. So there's probably enough out there that this is one of those issues where if you're a member and all of a sudden you get a balanced bill because you had a covered claim, but the doctor didn't get paid because the the your administrator diverted it, you have a claim, a good claim against your employer. And I would think you would bring it if your employer doesn't jump in to sort of protect you from that. Um, so things like that, things like, I think, um, Matt, you and I talked a little bit about the blue card program and whether or not, you know, at some point there there is going to be litigation over that because employers are agreeing to crazy things in that program. They're just agreeing to never ask for claims data, never review certain claims to pay fees for access to things that they shouldn't necessarily have to pay fees for. And then there can't be any sort of adjustment, even if you find an error after the fact. So there's some, you also don't know how claims are paid under that program. So there's a lot of things there that sort of stand out as places where current employees could begin bringing lawsuits. But again, I don't think we're ready yet for the sweeping, just excessive fee suits because we're still getting access to the data that would let those types of suits be brought. Um, Next question also by Chris. As the dust settles, as the gag clause attestation date has passed on how many file and what DOL, IRS, CMS plan to do for enforcement, you were surprised by how many employers did not know they needed to do this or were confused by what to do. There were also last minute letters to the three authorities to delay and provide more clarity. Well, that is true. And this is a huge problem with the whole gag clause law as written. And hopefully there's some pending legislation in the works that will strengthen sort of not just the removal of gag clauses, but also, um, you know, what to do after that. And the point of removing the gag clause, the point is remove them so you get your data. It's the gag clause is sort of the academic part. If you're just removing gag clauses, that's great, but you haven't done the thing that a fiduciary is supposed to do. The fiduciary is supposed to be getting the data and analyzing it and saying, is this a good use of our planned dollars? Am I being a good fiduciary by paying this? Why, and, and then this ties into a point you made a little earlier, Matt. Why are these claims not being paid at the discounted rate that we think we're getting? What happened? And, and then you find out that the discounted rate is just one type of way things are paid. There are provisions in the contract between the hospital and your administrative service provider that will affect what your plan pays that 
negate that that negotiated rate a lot of the time. And you don't even know what those are. You can't know any of this till you get your data. And you can't know get your data till you get the gag clauses out. So you got to get the gag clauses out. Yeah, and that's the whole point of the attestation is to show that you took that first step. But what you're really trying to do is get the data and analyze it. So then the next question is from Megan. Hi, Megan. Uh, are you able to give us an example of gag mm -hmm. clause provision in a contract? Um, it'd be a very sweet. Thank you. There's So the obvious gag clause provisions are things like mm -hmm. um, restrictions on audit rights. Now, I don't think that asking to do claims data review um, as the gag clause law is written is an audit. However, the carriers all take the position that it is an audit. And so they invoke the audit provisions and those are ridiculous. It's once a year, no matter how many claims your plan has, you can look at like 250 claims, they pick them. They, you know, you have to go on site. The, the carrier has to approve of the auditor you choose. You can't use someone who works on a contingency fee, which is interesting because when they were, when your own TPA finds their own mistakes and recovers the overpayments, mm -hmm. they do it on a contingency fee, but you can't hire someone else to do it on a contingency fee. They so save the money. Is, those are all gag clauses. Yeah. Obviously, mm -hmm. you don't want the fox guarding the hen house. You don't hire the same company that's doing the claims, that that's that's processing your claims to do the claims integrity review. Presumably, what you're paying for your per employee per month fee includes some form of integrity already, right? And you're not paying them to review themselves and add some integrity after the fact. You're hiring someone to help you monitor them, an outside company, someone that will do this. And, and so someone like 4C, Megan's company, or, you know, like Claim Informatics or Well Rhythms. There's a few of these guys out there that are really making me, there's a bunch of, of, of companies doing this. But, you know, that can actually look at your data, analyze it and tell you what they see is wrong. And, and it's shocking. And this is what motivates employers more than anything, by the way. Once you do get your claims data and have it reviewed, it is there's nothing more infuriating than getting that report and seeing all the mistakes, mistakes, I say nicely, all the overpayments, all the things that you didn't know you're paying for. And all the, also, there is a, sort of a rank level of incompetence that you don't expect, where it's just just really just poor claims handling in general. Sometimes these high dollar claims are never looked at. They're just auto adjudicated. No one's ever looking at them. And so there's, you know, bundled claims, things like that, all kinds of messy things that are found. I was say, so gag clauses, I was just gonna say, are anything that, that mm -hmm. keep you directly or indirectly from accessing your data. Audit provisions are the most obvious things like um, that only sort of that require you to get approval for someone to look at data that um, try to prevent you from using the data to make fiduciary decisions, which are pretty crazy. And, mm -hmm. you know, so there's companies like Subpop now that have algorithms that can help actually pick the gag clauses out of your mm -hmm. contracts and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can also, you know, just do it the old fashioned method, you know, and do a look through. But the, the obvious ones are easier to pick out. But anything that's going to prevent you from getting your data is a gag. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So we've got about five minutes and I see a couple of questions. I'll maybe kind of blend them to you and then you can bring it home. And, and uh, so the one is from Terry and he says that as all bukas own their own PBMs, how do they avoid self-dealing? So we have a vertical integration problem. Again, I think it maybe ties back to the status quo and are not all that motivated to fix what isn't broken for them. And then Megan had chimed in others you know, I think if, if so, if you're an employer or you're uh, an advisor who's advising who that employer is trusting and you're trying to do things right, uh, both in managing your plan, but also legally, which is really, I think, often parallel is what I'm seeing a lot of parallels here. But just maybe practically speaking, you're, over, you're overseeing a health plan, whomever you are in, in a variety of roles. What are things and who, who can help and what are things you can do what are things you should do? One, two, three, four, something like that to make sure you're in good shape here. Okay. The first thing you should do, mm -hmm. if you're trying to just limit your fiduciary exposure and be as good of a fiduciary as you can be in this environment, step one, make sure you have a fiduciary committee for your health. Mm -hmm. You know, and you probably already have one for your 401k committee. If you don't, you should have that too. But, and it could be the same committee, but it's probably better to be separate committees, separate skill sets. 
Um, and you want this committee to have a charter that explains exactly what the committee does. It has to have regular meetings. And that is the committee that will make the fiduciary decisions. It will consider all of these issues and discuss them and make decisions. Um, you want to have good meeting minutes from this. You want to make sure everyone on that committee is insured under your fiduciary liability policy and in their individual name capacity. Also, anyone say there's people not on the committee, but an HR that you delegate authority to or in different departments, name them under your fiduciary liability policy. Then you want to have sort of, I guess your first step is sort of, let's look at the plan we have now and do a, you know, let's take a look at it and see what's good, what's bad, what we need info on. And that's where you start. And you start by trying to figure out, do we know how much we're paying our vendors? This is a great place to start. And if you don't, that's terrible. You would never do that anywhere else. Just pay someone randomly and not know what you're paying them. Because the first thing you have to get a handle on is how much did we pay our broker last year? How much is our administrative service carrier getting from this? And, and you know, is this reasonable? Did we add up all the money they they take from the account that they take from for things like overpayment recovery? And are we adding that to the problem to really understand the total costs of what they're getting? What are we, and now as you get more sophisticated, you get into things like, what are we paying for MRIs? And can we look at publicly available information and start steering members to places that have, you know, $600 MRIs versus $6,000 MRIs? Um, can we start sort of looking at quality and, and start steering people away from disincentivizing our employees from going to facilities or hospitals that have very bad sort of you know, um, rates when it comes to reinfection rates, uh, maternal female mortality rates when it comes to, you know, having babies and things like that, um, admission rates, infection rates in the hospital, things like that. How do you, how do you, what can you do to increase quality while containing costs? But at the very beginning, what you're looking at is you get the committee, you start looking at who are our vendors, what are we paying them? Have we ever done an RFP? If not, should we be doing RFPs? Have we ever done an audit? of our TPA, if not do it immediately, immediately. The DOL recommends doing an audit of all your service providers every three to five years, of doing an RFP every three to five years. You should be doing an audit every year minimum. You should be looking at claims data all the time and it should become a routine thing where it doesn't have to be the whole committee, but it's somebody's role. Maybe you hire a vendor and this is their job is to sort of do ongoing monitoring of your claims data and they ping you when there's something strange and you stop payment and say, hey, don't take that money out until we understand this claim better. Because guess what? It's a lot easier to not pay something up front than to get the money back when it's already been paid. So you just have to start changing the way you do things. And, and that those are sort of a few quick ways to start. Excellent. Excellent. This was, uh, I mean, I was, I really enjoyed this discussion and perhaps we could even do a part two or a part three sometime. Sure. Uh, we do have a conference we're planning for August, which I would also, I have a place for you if you have the time. And um, <laughs> that, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of practical things. You can reach out to Berger Montag for help. And, um, you know, and a lot of it, you know, I think is uh, an article that I'll publish uh, from the book in February, but it's about trustworthy partners. And one of the things that I realized is I don't have the time, resources, or even the knowledge to go out and try to manage untrustworthy partners because they've got a lot up their sleeve. And so, but when we find trustworthy partners uh, is what I've started, what I assembled at, at Merrill Steel and other companies across the state have done and are doing in that now I, even when I'm not looking, I can at least believe they're trying to do what's right for me and find a win-win type situation where I don't have to analyze contracts or, or what have you maybe, and uh, be able to just win together, which is really the only thing that's sustainable. And that's what our self-fund health plan is, is that it's a, a proven employer designed plan that uh, really creates a win for providers, create, creates a win for all players, TPAs, PBMs, et cetera but especially the losing half of this relationship. We, we're seeing right now a win from the sellers and a lose for the buyers, and that's just not sustainable. And so uh, there's a lot of energy, and I think as costs continue to kind of skyrocket, we're gonna see more and more of that. So we go in and we implement this plan and then we and we help manage it for you under, under your direction, uh, but with all the knowledge that we've learned from working with uh, my own experience and then these employers. So that's one of the ways you can do, you can DIY it. You can look at companies to help you manage it. 
Uh, but getting out of that old fashioned seller oriented insurance box where you probably can't sustain long term, even the big ones, even the big national companies, I think are going to start seeing this. So thank you again, Julie, for your time. Certainly enjoyed the discussion. Uh, incredibly insightful. And um, I wish everyone a great day. And thank you for your participation. And and uh, we'll have an announcement coming out for the February one soon. So thanks again. Thanks for having me.